Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining our TREAD talk. Uh, I'm Jessica Carlsberg, Executive Director of TREAD Coalition, and I will be your moderator for this evening. I'm a sixth generation Texan and proud to be advocating for landowners and helping protect private property rights. For those of you who aren't familiar with TREAD, the acronym stands for the Texas Real Estate Advocacy and Defense Coalition. We are a nonpartisan member-based organization that educates, advocates for, and defends landowners and the rural communities they live in at the local, state, and federal levels. I have put my contact information in the chat box, which is located on the right-hand side. This is also where you can submit questions to our panelists, and we will be addressing those questions at the end of our panel discussion. Tread Talks is our newest educational programming that allows us to connect landowners, experts, legislators, and the general public on issues affecting rural landowners across the state. Our programming covers issues including water, eminent domain, public health, education, parks, arts and culture, and conservation, which brings us to tonight's discussion on conservation easements. With us this evening are two seasons panelists on this issue. Lori Olson has served as the executive director of the Texas Land Trust Council since July of 2011, working to strengthen the coalition of land and water conservation organizations working across the state of Texas. In her work the count, with the council, Lori engages in state and federal advocacy, strategic outreach and research projects that promote the many benefits of conservation and offers training and technical assistance, including hosting the annual Texas Land Conservation Conference. Lori has more than two decades of experience in the field of land conservation, working with land trusts in Oregon, North Carolina, Georgia, and Texas. She's the former executive director of the Eno River Association, a land trust located in Durham, North Carolina. And she's also served as project manager for the, Texas, for the Trust for Public Land, focusing in Central Texas uh, on conservation efforts with government agency partners, including the City of Austin, San Marcos and San Antonio, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Travis and Hayes counties. A native Texan, Lori is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin with a BS in biology and a graduate of the University of Oregon with a master's in community and regional planning, as well as a master's of science uh, in public affairs. She has also completed her certificate in nonprofit management at Duke University and is an avid conservationist and lover of the outdoors. Lori lives in the Texas Hill Country with her family. Next, we have Mark Steinbach, who is the executive director for the Texas Land Conservancy. It's a non governmental, nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting land all over the state of Texas. TLC is in the business of protecting natural areas from the negative effects of land fragmentation and poorly planned development, and to help landowners find an economical, realistic alternative to selling their land to a developer that allows ownership to remain in, the hand, in their hands, but puts the responsibility of conserving it in theirs. Mark earned a bachelor's in wildlife and fishery sciences and a master's in rangeland e ecolo ecology and management, both from Texas A&M University. His master's research focused on Texas landowners and their knowledge of conservation policy and land management techniques. Mark received a PhD from the University of Montana in Missoula from the College of Forestry and Conservation, and his dissertation and postdoctoral work was focused on land fragmentation in the Rocky Mountain region. He previously worked at the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department where he was a private lands wildlife biologist, providing technical assistance to landowners in the Hill Country. And Mark's land management experience also stems from his academic career and working on his family's farm in Washington County. So thank you both very much for being with us this evening. Um, and I know that you have some presentations for us, so I will hand it over to the two of you. Great, thank you, Jessica. I'm gonna go ahead and get my presentation up. Whoops, go back, get my presentation up here. Um, just wanna make sure you guys just see the slides from your end. Um, all right, well, thank you for that introduction. Um, can you hear me, everything good technologically? 
thumbs up. Okay, wonderful. Um, my name is Lori, and thanks for that introduction. That was the full bio introduction. <laughs> it's always funny um, people uh, go through that whole thing. But um, so hopefully everyone on the on the webinar or the talk today is is uh, covered. We have a Longhorn and an Aggie on your panel, so hopefully that makes most people happy <laughs> one way or another. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm excited to, um, to get to talk to this group and, you know, hopefully um, we'll share some information with you guys today that will be useful and that you can share with others um, about land trusts and conservation and all the exciting things that Mark and I get to do every day. Um, the first thing um, that, you know, again, you know, when we do this work in Texas, it carries a particular importance. Um, and that's because, you know, 90 over 95% of our lands here are in private hands, um, which, you know, makes it extremely important for our private landowners to be partners um, with the conservation community in our efforts to, to conserve our natural resources um, in Texas. So, you know, our, our, conservation work is is vital to you know the public interest to the preservation of our wildlife and our water resources um, habitat um, and also you know it's 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 going to be helping to mitigate climate change um, it's going to help to preserve our biodiversity um, you may have heard um, recently um, with the change administration of the 30 by 30 initiative um, which is the effort to preserve 30 percent of our uh, land mass or land area um, by the year 2030, which is not very far from now. So um, in Texas, um, I think that, you know, private landowners are going to have a, a, a critical role to play. And in fact, you know, there's no way we could even get close to achieving that, um, that goal without um, landowner partnerships. So I think, you know, for, for us and the work that we do, we're excited to, to see how that, that, um, that initiative, that goal kind of shapes up and what opportunities there will be for private landowner conservation. I think we're going to see, hopefully, a tremendous increase in the funding available for conservation easement programs in the future. And, um, you know, we're looking forward to getting, you know, creative in, in all the different types of, of ways that our community can partner with private landowners um, to achieve to achieve some, some important conservation goals in the future. So what is a land trust? Um, a land trust is basically a, a nonprofit organization that holds lands um, or conservation easements for conservation purposes. Um, and they also can engage in a number of educational or other um, outreach or restoration or you know, any kind of programs um, related to conservation. Um, but the, you know, the history of land trust work goes back, you know, quite a long time, over 100 years in the United States. Um, but most of the explosive growth has happened recently. Um, land tr in the like in Texas in particular, I think in 1981 is when the Conservation Easement Act was enacted um, federally. But in the in Texas, it kind of caught on a little bit later. Um, but in the, the 90s and 2000s, and when when land trust and conservation work started to ramp up. Um, but basically, landowners, land trusts work with uh, both private landowners and with public agencies to help preserve all types of conservation lands, um, projects um, from public parks to conservation easements um, to mitigation banks, all kinds of things. Um, they're working to conserve all types of habitats. My organization um, is called the Texas Land Trust Council, and um, it is basically the state association of all the land and water conservation groups in Texas. And so we work with um, all of our members um, to, you know, do any kind of programs um, that are going to benefit them. Um, we do advocacy work at the state and federal level. Um, we produce an annual conference, um, as Jessica mentioned, the Texas Land Conservation Conference. Um, we do a lot of technical uh, resources like GIS database and, and a, a landowner guide for conservation easements. We've done an economic benefits analysis um, of conserve, conserved lands in Texas, looking at different um, benefits for flood mitigation and water quality and those types of things. So we've done some uh, a, a statewide uh, messaging and outreach projects. So any, any number of things we do, we do it all. We do it, we do whatever the land trust community of Texas says they need. Um, land trust council tries to make that happen. And originally we started um, as a program of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department um, back in the late 90s. And then TLTC was spun out as a 501c3 back in 2003. And so, um, you know, we've been working ever since to, um, you know, just basically improve the land conservation efforts of Texas land trusts. We have right now currently about 33 members um, of our coalition and those 
land trusts are very diverse. Um, they focus on different types of conservation lands. They, some of them are all volunteers. Some of them have many staff. Um, they're all governed by um, volunteer boards of directors and they work all across the state. Um, some are local, regional, some are national or even international um, in the case of the Nature Conservancy. And they do all kinds of different things from protecting wetlands to agricultural lands to natural habitats, all kinds of things. So these are, this slide just sort of gives you sort of a idea of all the different types of organizations across the state um, that are members of our coalition. And again, they're in every corner of the state from El Paso to, you know, Galveston to up to Dallas, Fort Worth and, and our, our groups do cover all kinds of um, of habitats like prairies or or um, rivers or watersheds, you know, each land trust sort of organically defines what it wants to work to protect and what its mission is going to be in terms of the conservation work it's going to do. Um, and then it works with its uh, volunteers um, and staff and members to to make that happen. So landowners, they work, I mean, land trusts um, work with a variety of partners to do this work. We cannot do it alone. And um, of course, with conservation easements, um, private landowners are our essential partners. Um, we literally can't, can't conserve lands um, without them. And we also work with um, other NGOs um, or with state and local governments. Um, obviously, a lot of times we have funding partners at the state or local or federal level that help to fund some of these projects. And I'll talk a little bit more more about, about those opportunities um, in just a minute. But land trusts are, you know, they have the natural resource, you know, knowledge, wildlife management, um, natural resource management, um, conservation strategies and priorities. And they, they do that type of work to try to figure out what lands they want to try to conserve. And then they try to find landowner partners um, who have those, those types of lands um, and work with them to, um, to, put, play, to place conservation easements on their properties. So land trust work is completely, you know, conservation easements is they are voluntary, and so land trusts are, are working with willing partners um, wherever they can uh, find them. And um, we are, you know, doing that in a strategic way um, and also opportunistically, um, you know, wherever those opportunities present themselves. Sometimes a project can be really simple with a, just a one landowner donating an easement donating an easement um, and other times you might have, you know, a property with multiple family members and multiple um, funding partners and you know that those are more challenging and take a, a lot longer to do um, but you know every project is interesting and fun and, and, and challenging and that's what makes this work um, interesting so um, some of the strategies that land trusts employ obviously the conservation easement is one of our biggest tools um, we also you know purchase lands outright and have uh, land trusts have preserves that they own and manage um, or lands that are donated to them they also work with conservation developers um, or mitigation bankers to hold easements on those types of lands and so um, there's a variety of, of ways that land trusts are involved um, sometimes there's you know public private partnerships where land trusts are, are going out and soliciting um, landowners to come to the table to perhaps um, place their property in an easement or a public uh, park for that will be held by a government entity like in the city of San Antonio. A lot of land trusts work to bring landowners to the table to participate with their Edwards Aquifer Protection Program. Um, and uh, but now those easements are held by the city of San Antonio. So sometimes there's some public private partnerships um, that occur as well. So conservation easements is one of are one of the main tools that we use. And um, Mark Steinbach with the Texas Land Conservancy is going to talk to you in a lot more detail about those coming up. But um, you know, just kind of want to give you an overview. You know, most of the easements that were done that have been done in Texas, and there's over a million acres um, now that are under conservation easement in Texas, um, were done in the you know first you know 15 years or so of the 2000s. Um, so they they're sort of a recently blooming tool um, that has been used. Um, it's it's uh, they've been around though since you know the early 80s when they were at the Uniform Conservation Easement Act was actually established um, in Congress. So um, but they're you know they're obviously one of the main tools that land trusts use. Um, to conserve land is certainly an important tool in Texas. 
just wanted to give you a little bit of background on the land trust you know, movement in general. Um, there's over a thousand land trusts um, operating across the United States um, that have conserved more than 56 million acres of land. So um, these, these numbers are actually from the last land trust census that our, our national um, association, the Land Trust Alliance um, tallied up. And so uh, they're actually about to put out a new a new uh, land trust census. So those numbers should go up very substantially, hopefully very soon. But as you can see, there's just a lot of people involved in this work around the country. From the Texas perspective, um, we have conserved, and we just did an update on our database as well, looking at all the lands that land trusts have helped to conserve here in Texas, um, what, over 1.8 million acres. Um, again, over a million of that is in conservation easements. And we have 33 members right now um, working across the state. So, um, you know, this is a big accomplishment, you know, especially when you consider, you know, the state park system is like 600, 650,000 acres that we have over a million in conservation easements. It's, it's quite substantial. Um, and it, we hope that that number will continue um, to grow in the future. So land trusts can work with a variety of funding programs. Um, these are all federal funding programs that are available to help fund conservation acquisitions and conservation easements. Um, the biggest one that we work with is the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program. That is a, a, a funding pot of money that is available through the Farm Bill. Um, it's over $500 million a year, each year. And so that's the largest source of conservation easement funding um, that's available. And in fact, the Land Trust Council has just, we just uh, started a new position that works with NRCS um, it, that is a coordinator for that program to help and move those projects and get new projects into the system and hopefully get additional funding um, and conservation, enhance our conservation outcomes here in Texas through that program. There's also uh, the Forest Legacy Program, the Section 6 of the uh, Endangered Species Act funding. There's the North American Wetlands Conservation Act, otherwise known as NACA. And then, of course, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which was um, fully funded um, like, like a year ago that was perpetually fully funded by the Congress. So that was a big, big uh, conservation when um, people, whoop, whoop, hello. Sorry, <laughs> my, my mouse moved my slides board. Anyway, so there's um, there's definitely some a lot of federal funding opportunities available. Um, and again, we're hopeful that with some of the new um, priorities for 30 by 30 and also climate mitigation and climate change um, that you know agricultural conservation easements in particular will play a role in helping to sequester carbon um, and protect biodiversity. And so we're looking forward to um, seeing what opportunities again for advocacy at the federal level to enhance these all these different pots of money um, will be in the coming, coming years. Um, at the state level, we have a, pro a program as well. Um, it is a modestly funded uh, program um, with $2 million um, of biennium and it's called the Texas uh, Farm and Ranch Lands Conservation Program, um, and it was it's been around since 2005. But um, prior to 2016, it wasn't really uh, appropriated by this, at the state level. It was more uh, there was some pass through funding from the from the feds that went into preserve coastal lands. But starting in in, in 2015, um, we were able to get our first appropriation of two million dollars into this fund, and this fund helps to um, fund the purchase and acquisition of conservation easements on important farming and ranching lands. So similar to the federal agricultural conservation easement program. So this, this program was envisioned to sort of, um, you know, basically work together with that farm bill program. But we've got $6 million so far invested in this, um, hopefully another 2 million in the coming weeks when the legislature wraps up its budget. And um, this program is very popular helps to fund um, the easements, but also transaction costs and all kinds of um, uh, you know, projects across the state has been very successful and very um, well utilized. Another funding source um, or another, you know, incentive that we have at the federal level for conservation easements um, is the um, tax deduction. So this is a federal income tax deduction. It is an enhanced deduction that the land conservation community advocated for, for, you know, many, 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 many years. And it was finally made a permanent part of the U.S. tax code in December of 2015. And 
this basically allows a landowner, if they are to donate a conservation easement um, or even a portion of a conservation easement, they can deduct the value of that easement from their federal income taxes. And the conservation easement incentive basically expands the deductibility on one of these over and above what a normal charitable deduction would be allowed. So um, we're, uh, with, when you donate a CE, you can get up to 50% um, of your gross adjusted gross income um, deducted and you can carry that deduction forward for up to 15 years. You have a long time to burn that through that deduction to hopefully um, get all the value out of it. But um, so it's a this is also a very popular tool that we use. Um, and, you know, oftentimes these projects are done, you know, with some funding and some donation. So it's often, you know, kind of a, a combination that makes, you know, gets these projects to the finish line where the landowner does have some um, percentage of the easement that they are donating um, and then perhaps some that they're able to secure um, funding for. And also, there's, of course, the estate tax. That's a possibility depending on how large the property is and whether or not that's um, useful. But if you place an easement on your property, it obviously reduces the value. The development rights are you know, largely stripped away. And so what you can do with the property um, is, you know, is basically limited. And so the value drops. And so and it could possibly result in uh, a reduction or just elimination of the estate tax, depending on your situation. But these are just some of the um, different incentives there are financially for landowners to consider doing, doing one of these. Um, just wanted to give you guys, um, before I pass over to Mark, some of the resources that we have on our website, um, which, you know, for landowners or just people interested in this, um, legislators or staffers or anybody who's interested in learning more about um, land trusts or easements or how they work. Um, obviously, we do put on a, co a conference, which we just had um, in April. Um, we'll be having our 2022 event in March of next year. Um, and then we also uh, put together a guidebook on conservation easements, and you can get that um, on our website as well digitally. And if you want a copy, um, you can email me and I'll be happy to mail you a hard copy. We also have a lot of our other reports, like our uh, evaluation of uh, the economic benefits of conservation lands and other um, looking at the farm and ranch and conservation program and some of the other reports that we've been involved in over the years are all on the website um, just to give you a lot more background information on easements. Um, we provide some transaction matching grants and so again through our landowner member, I mean land trust members, um, landowners can be eligible to um, get some of those grants and we do a variety of outreach and education um, activities as well. Um, you can also find on our website um, our conservation lands inventory. So this is our big statewide database of all the conserved lands that land trusts have been involved with in Texas. Um, there's, you know, through time, we have maps, um, we have actually conserved lands by county. You can see how many easement, how many acres are under easement, how many acres to be simple. Um, so, you know, you can you can go and check that out and, and look at, you know, any of those data points. Um, and we update this every two years. So we're about to actually put out a new update that's going to include all of the data through the end of 2020. Um, so that should be coming out actually, um, hopefully by next month. But um, this is a great tool for us, not only because it communicates sort of the full breadth of the work that our community is engaged in, but it's also a great way to utilize, you know, to be able to show where our work is when we're working with legislators and advocating for this, um, for these funding sources to show, you know, all the good work that's been done across the state. So um, I'll leave my, my, I put my email in the chat, but there it is again. And before, um, I just wanted to provide my contact information and, but I'm going to be obviously on this um, through the end. So you guys can ask questions um, either now or wait till the end and I'll go ahead and um, pull my, my screen down and let Mark um, take over from here. Oops, we Mark, got it. seems like your audio might have disconnected. Try maybe unmuting again. Oh, 
I was gonna say someone is pointing out that yes, if you are a farmer and rancher that that derives your main income from farming and ranching, you can actually deduct 100% of your AGI um, when you do a conservation easement. So that is a good oh, good no. point. Yep, I can hear you now, Mark. Sorry, Lori. <laughs> there we go. Um, thanks, Lori. Uh, so my name is Mark Steinbach. I'm the executive director of the Texas Land Conservancy. Uh, we work statewide, um, primarily working in the Hill Country in East Texas, but we have projects everywhere from far west Texas um, all the way to almost the Louisiana border and Red River all the way down to the to the coast. Uh, nothing in the Panhandle, which uh, cuts down on some driving time. So let me get my project or program started. Um, I'm going to hit on some high points that Lori talked about give some real uh, kind of specifics on how the easement process works for landowners, what it can do, what it can't do, and then touch on some of the tax ramifications that landowners can enjoy from the benefits of this. So first off, I think it often kind of goes unsaid that in Texas, because we are a private land state, uh, the only two real mechanisms for land conservation are going to be through the state parks and wildlife department, you know, very small federal holdings with some national forests um, and Big Bend. And then the bulk of that relies on private landowners because the state park system while they're growing that incrementally is not making leaps and bounds. And so what we're doing, working with the private landowners is, is our only real uh, path forward to create more land conservation and uh, benefits in the rural areas. Lori hit on this just briefly, but what is a conservation easement? Um, it is simply a legal agreement between a property owner and an entity. And so an entity could be a land trust, which we are, which Lori represents. It could be a city. Uh, it could be a county, it could be a municipality, so it has to be some kind of um, qualified group that can hold an interest in this property with the intent of doing it. So just any old regular nonprofit is not going to be able to hold a conservation easement. It's going to need to be a special, specialized entity. The easement absolutely allows the landowner to maintain the ownership of the property, and that's one of the key points in this, that the land trust is not taking anything except the rights to protect the property from development and removing that. And I'll get into that in just a second. Lori touched on this briefly too about types of conservation easements. And so the three main areas that we work in are donated conservation easements, which are far and away the most prevalent. Um, that's where the landowner just voluntarily enters into the agreement and the benefit to them aside from the protection of the property is they are gonna be getting a federal income tax incentive. That, that being said, the government or the uh, governing regulations are set by the IRS on that. In case you really want to see them, there's the section in the IRS code for it. A purchased easement is if an entity wants to pay the full amount for the value of that conservation easement and they have the resources, maybe it's a grant, maybe it's a bond, who knows what that is, but they can pay for the full toll basically for that, for that project. And the one that kind of straddles both boats is a bargain sale. And this is where you're gonna get paid a portion of those conservation values. And then the other portion is gonna be treated as a, as a contribution or a deduction. So this is similar to the, to the NRCS program that Lori talked about. They're gonna pay about half the value of the conservation easement. The landowner is gonna donate the other half. And so you're gonna get some cash up front and you're also gonna be able to take a write off on that donated side of the equation. So those are the three primary methods that we use with conservation easements. So specifically, how does a conservation easement work? For any of you lawyers in the crowd, you'll uh, distinctly remember the bundle of sticks analogy that your property rights professor probably ingrained in your head. Uh, for everyone else in the crowd, the way that land and property rights is often described is you have all these different assets or pieces of your land that can be marketed or monetized or given away. Uh, those can be the development rights. Most commonly in Texas, that's the mineral rights. It could be grazing, timber, hunting, you know, the, the list goes on and on. A conservation easement simply takes that development right, that, that piece of the stick bundle, and moves it to the land trust. 
all the other pieces of the puzzle stay with the landowner. So you can still enjoy all of the uses of those rights. You're just giving up or taking away those development rights from the conservation easement. So why would somebody want to do a conservation easement? Uh, first and foremost is protecting that property and its conservation values. Um, the most common uh, landowners that we work with are generational landowners. Property has probably been in the family 100 years. It's not uncommon for us to have uh, families with centennial uh, ranches in their family. Uh, and they want to see that protected. They know that the value of the land has increased so much that it has a tremendous amount of meaning and sentiment to the family and they want to see that protected. Uh, it does provide income tax benefits and I'll get into that more. And then it can also help with landowners with the estate planning and I'll give some examples of explicitly how that works as well. So oftentimes people say, well, you know, what, what are, what's it gonna do? Well, an easement is customized to every piece of property. Uh, it's customized to the landowner or what they want to do to their children, those children's wishes. And we try to make this a, a living document because it does have to be perpetual. So every easement, it may start with a boilerplate template, but it's going to be customized on how many homes you might want to be able to build. Uh, are there specific things that you want to provide on the property, such as a family cemetery? Maybe you want to grow grapes and have your own vineyard out there. You, you know, the, the, the choices go on and on for what can be done within reason. Uh, you're not going to be able to enjoy large scale commercial development. You're not going to, be able to put in a motocross track or a golf course, things like this. Uh, the real specific thing that I want to hit on here, though, is the public does not have access to these properties. That is a, a big misconception that's often put on conservation easements, um, but that is absolutely not the case for a conservation easement that's held um, for these purposes. On the landowner side of the equation, there's a few things that have to be uh, upheld with that conservation easement. So the land has to be managed consistently with the terms of the easement. So if, for instance, uh, there says there can't be any wholesale clearing of trees out there, you can't take a bulldozer and push down all the oak trees. Um, you can't take a, like I said, a property and turn it into a, a golf course, something like that. So there's gonna be specific conservation responsibilities that go along with this. Um, you have to allow the land trust to come out to the property once a year, and this is called monitoring, and that's a specification in the IRS code. Uh, we have to say, yes, the, you know, the terms are being upheld. We don't have a mobile home park that's being installed out here. Um, it is never done as a surprise visit. It's always done uh, with the landowner's knowledge and uh, total acceptance, and we're usually riding around with the landowner, uh, checking on things and having, having a conversation. Uh, you need to notify the land trust before conveying the property. Uh, like I said, the property can be passed to the next generation. It can be sold. We consistently have properties that sell all the time on the open market, but giving the land trust a heads up that that's going to happen is important. And then finally, you have to pay the property taxes because the conservation easement doesn't do anything to uh, minimize or to nullify or property taxes for that. On the land trust side of things, uh, we do have to monitor the property once a year. And so, for instance, in our organization, we have four stewardship staff responsible for different parts of the state. Um, and they are constantly traveling to all of those different properties, making those site visits, putting together what's called a monitoring report, um, and just kind of checking those boxes for us. Uh, and then we have to keep all of those records in a, in a you know, very accurate method. And that's part of our accreditation process that goes through our national organization. And finally, if there is ever a violation of an easement, we have to enforce the terms of that easement. And that can be either a simply a corrective letter to say, hey, you know, clean up this pile of debris that you've thrown out here, or you've done something that's completely in violation of this. And if it would actually be necessary, you would have to go to court to remedy that or to mitigate that in some in some manner. A lot of folks are under the impression that easements can do certain things like uh, stop condemnation. I'll get calls routinely say, hey, there's about to be a power line or a gas pipeline coming across my property. We can't stop that. Um, there is a very narrow window if it is a federally uh, enacted conservation easement that it has some condemnation protection to it, but a traditional conservation easement can't do that. Um, we can't override other existing easements or interests in property, uh, particularly mineral interests. So if someone has uh, given away the mineral interest to the property and you're trying to enact a conservation easement on it, 
Uh, we have to explore that and figure out if those mineral interests are going to uh, impact the conservation easement values or have some other negative impact, particularly surface use. So any surface mining, coal, gravel, sand would be a totally uh, negate the conservation easement and you wouldn't be allowed. Uh, subsurface minerals are a different animal and those are typically allowed. You just have to kind of find a way to make them work within that. Uh, and then finally, like I said before, the property taxes, if you're in an agricultural tax rate, you are not gonna get any lower with the appraisal district on your property taxes. Uh, typically appraisal districts do not recognize conservation easements. Um, you know, there's out of 254 counties in the state, there's probably 150 that don't even have conservation easements in their county because they're still kind of a niche tool and they just don't have a uniform recognition across the state uh, in those different counties. So what does the process look like on one of these? Well, first, it's gonna be an initial discussion and a site visit. We're gonna come out, we're gonna walk around the property with you, try to understand what your goals are, um, what the history of the property is, where the property is going, like I said. Do you have kids? Do you have grandkids? Uh, what, what is this all gonna look like? Uh, you're gonna draft an easement. Your attorney is gonna work with our attorney. We're gonna try to make the terms of what y'all wanna do fit into that and make sure everything is, is uh, acceptable on both sides of that. There's gonna be a property appraisal. It's a very specific uh, appraisal that's gonna look at the before values and the after values on a project. And that's where that tax benefit is gonna come from. There is a required documentation called a baseline document report. It's a very detailed uh, report that has pictures, has maps, it has all the flora and fauna, all the infrastructure on the property. We need a starting point in time whenever we enact a conservation easement so that when we look down the road, we say, oh, where did this house come from? It was never done here five years ago and now it shows up. Or there's, you know, hey, we found a new species of bird out there that didn't exist at this time. So it provides kind of a, a roadmap for the history of the property. We're gonna conduct title review. We're gonna get a title commitment from the local title company to make sure we find any uh, outstanding mineral interest, any clouds on the title, anything that would basically stop that conservation easement from being uh, enacted. If there is a mortgage on the property, typically you will have to get that mortgage subordinated uh, to say, yes, the easement has the right because if the mortgage was foreclosed upon, it could you know, terminate the easement. Uh, that's usually not a big deal, especially with rural lenders like Capital Farm Credit. They understand the process and are willing to do stuff like that. Um, but it's something to consider. And then finally, we execute the easement. It does get recorded in the county, so it's always in the chain of title uh, that when it's passed on or it's looked in the future, it's gonna, be, it's gonna show up, and so no one's surprised by the conservation easement being in existence. Um, as I said before, the tax code with the IRS has uh, four specific uh, qualifications and only one of these has to be met uh, to make the conservation easement a deductible easement. Far and away, the most common qualification in Texas is the number one, protect a relatively natural wildlife habitat. That's probably 99% of the conservation easements. Uh, conserve an open space, so if for some reason that would not say that was not habitat of some kind, you would typically use that. If you fell into a historic preservation category, you might be able to do it if there is a very well documented uh, use of that property for some reason. It would typically require the Texas Historic Commission or some other agency that would provide some certification of that. And finally, if you do want to put your land into public use, um, that could be a reason to qualify. But like I said, that is extremely, you know, just out of the ordinary. Uh, I think that's probably more common for municipalities to do something like that, but it's never been done for any projects that I've ever worked on. So I'm going to explain a little bit of how the actual tax valuation works on a conservation easement. So in general terms, if you have a piece of property that is a valued at $1 million on the market right now, Typically, a conservation easement is going to reduce the value of that property because we're taking away some of those development rights around 30%. That's a sliding scale. If we were sitting right outside of Austin, it might be 50%. If you're in the middle of West Texas or the Panhandle, it might be 20%. It just varies on the demand for that property. But we use 30% as kind of a ballpark. So the property is reduced in value by 30%, which is $300,000. 
that is the charitable deduction that is being given to a 501c3 organization like ourselves. The land after that is now valued at $700,000. So this is where the tax valuation comes from when we're looking at a donate, a purely donated conservation easement. And the deduction works in this manner. Let's assume that a landowner has an adjusted gross income and AGI of $100,000. Right now, the landowner can deduct 50% of their AGI of federal income tax for 15 years. So they can take $50,000 half, and it can be deducted from their pot of money, which is $300,000 until it's used up. So in year one, he's got a $300,000 pot of money. He takes $50,000. He takes 50,000 all the way down and he's using it up in year six. If you had a bigger pot of money or a bigger AGI, you could use that up in a faster sequence uh, or you might be able to use it all the way through the 15 years, just depending on how your particular situation works. From an estate tax standpoint, like I said, you may be looking at a piece of property that is worth $15 million. And then if you reduce that by 30%, it's reducing that property down to 10 and a half million, which would get you right now just below the current estate tax uh, threshold, which is pretty high. If estate taxes go down uh, is, is reset again here in, in a few years, this may have more of an impact for a lot of folks. But right now, it's kind of in the, in the middle road of it's making that big a difference. But what it does is it, it devalues that property so that asset can be moved to the next generation, hopefully to avoid the estate tax altogether or at least you know offset it in some way. So I often get time or often get asked, uh, well, what are things? change what can I do well we can't just willy-nilly change a conservation easement they're in, they're in perpetuity uh, there will be an amendment provision in most conservation easements but the way conservation easement amendments work is they have to be conservation positive or conservation neutral and that's somewhat of a, a math equation that we're going to say if there is this much that can be developed on that property or allowed and we want to amend it for something else it has to be less than what was done before so in this example someone has has reserved the right to build four houses on their conservation easement. And the next owner says, you know what, I only need two houses, but I really need a spot to land my helicopter. That's gonna be a really small footprint compared to those other two houses. We're gonna amend the conservation easement, take away two houses, and now we're gonna allow for a helicopter landing pad. Uh, and that's simply done as a square footage of how much was that allowed to build on those properties? Is it less, is it more, is it equal? And we're balancing that, that out in an amendment. That's a fairly uncommon practice. Uh, we tried to build in enough flexibility in all of these things for uses, but every now and then, particularly the ones that are older, the 1980s, 1990s easements, we just didn't have as much forethought on a lot of these things. And so we're trying to you know, make, make them, like I said, kind of living documents. Um, there is absolutely cost associated with these conservation easements, uh, and, and it's on, on both sides of the table. For the landowner, uh, you don't have to have an attorney represent you. If you are not an attorney, it's definitely a good idea. And there's a few folks around the state uh, that do specialize in helping landowners and they need to retain one of them. Uh, the baseline report is a required document. Um, typically those can range from you know very little to 5,000, maybe more if it's a big piece of property. Uh, recently, Lori mentioned that we've been able to provide some grants to organizations to offset those costs. So that's a small, small win for landowners. Uh, title report and title commitment, it just depends on, you know, how complicated that is and what the local title company is going to charge. A survey or, or an accurate property description is absolutely required. If you have a recent survey that's been done in the past several years, that's probably more than adequate. If you have a very old survey that goes back, you know, decades, it's going to have to be redone because just the, the calls, the meets and bounds may not be accurate to what we're trying to create. Um, if you're in a situation where the minerals are not attached to the property, you're probably going to have to get a mineral report that either delineates who owns what, if there's a likelihood of minerals being developed, uh, and kind of specifying that. And then if you are going to take a deduction, you absolutely have to get the appraisal for that deduction. And those can range from ten dollars to $15,000 because they're such a specialized uh, appraisal report. Uh, if you're not going to take a tax deduction, you don't have to pay for the appraisal. That's a, that's a variable that you can take out of the equation. The final piece of this is a stewardship endowment. And what that is, is the land trust, when we take on a project, is taking on a perpetual monitoring responsibility. 
Uh, we're going to have to make a trip to this property once a year. Uh, it takes time and energy on our part and more expensive and more importantly, it takes cost. And so we take a property, we look at it, we run the numbers to say it's going to take this much time to travel there, this many hours on the ground, this many hours in the office to write the report. And then we use an endowment calculator to simply say, if we invest this much money, it's going to spin off that much revenue for us on an annual basis to cover those costs. Uh, the good thing is that's also a deductible uh, contribution for the landowner, so it's a small win in that regard. Um, that's all I have for, for my side, so we're happy to take some questions now, and if we overlook something or gloss, gloss past it, then let us know. Great. Well, thank you both. Um, that was extremely informative, um, even for me. Uh, granted, I've been with Tread a while now, but you know, there's so much to learn about um, land and opportunities for conservation. So we have some questions. Um, one to follow up with you, Mark, is if you could go into a little bit more detail on the lack of uniformity and value recognition by appraisal districts. This particular person had a non-ag exempt property, which include, was included in their conservation easement and the appraisal district accepted the appraiser's residual per acre value. I said, my, my experience is you may be able to convince a appraisal district of that, but because so few of them have ever been exposed to this or they may have never had knowledge of it, there's no guarantee. Uh, it's just like, since it's not dictated in our our state tax code about this. It's not like an ag tax. It has no relevance to that. There's no guarantee of that. So uh, like I said, there's just, I can't, I can't speak to that specific situation, but there's nothing to, to hang your hat on that's gonna be accepted at every county level. I think most easements probably already have, are an ag valuation or wildlife valuation anyway. So there's not a, not a lot there there in terms of lowering, but in this particular instance that this um, person is raising, if you did have a portion of the easement that was you know, not an ag valuation, then yeah, you would just, I think county by county, county appraiser would just have to go argue your case. Okay, this is um, another question that I think is extremely interesting and it's something that I know I'm dealing with when I live in the Dripping Springs area, but it's also something of concern to a lot of other landowners as Texas is growing and changing so rapidly with an influx of people moving here. Um, so this one particular person has three ranches that surround their ranch that are that have been sold to developers and now they're surrounded by a huge subdivision. So how would you combat the aggressive offers of partnering with developers and convince land poor uh, ranchers to not develop? I mean, the, the, the either purchased easements or bargain sale that we talked about is the biggest incentive to help uh, provide some direct cost to those, those folks. The, the downside is um, it's still, t it's time intensive. None of those programs move quickly. For instance, if you're going to work with the NRCS programs, you're probably looking at an 18 month, maybe a two year commitment to get through that process. Um, and then if you're looking, unfortunately, the Parks and Wildlife is limited. They get a very small amount of funding on a biennium basis. And so the, the chances to get those monies are, are really dwindling. So if we could you know, it knock on wood, if we, if we had more money in the pot, if NRCS got more money, we'd be able to offer more uh, opportunities. I think. Another question is, who determines the minimum number of acres a tract of land must contain in order to be eligible for a conservation easement? There's no legal standard. There's no minimum. It's, it's the land trust or the entity you're working with. Um, what I will say, and I had this question yesterday talking to a landowner, is there is an economy of scale on every conservation easement. So if I'm working on a five acre conservation easement or a 5,000 acre conservation easement, you still have to pay an attorney. You still have to get an appraisal. You still have to do certain things. And all those costs are fixed. And so your tax benefit is going to be significantly smaller on a small tract of land if that's what you're going for. Um, and so just, sometimes it just doesn't make financial sense to do that. If you, for instance, have a, and this is a very niche situation, we did a project where Parks and Wildlife 
had some very specific funding for a very rare plant species in, in East Texas. And we did like a 50 acre conservation easement because this was the only place that plant existed, but they paid those landowners very well for that. That worked out great, but that's a, that's a pretty niche thing. So the small, small acreage just a lot of times doesn't make sense. Okay. And then um, let's see, what are the parameters for a track's eligibility for a conservation easement? I guess some of that was discussed. Yeah. Once again, that's going to go back to uh, perhaps the specifics of that property. Uh, if you came to us and said, hey, I've got, you know, a golf course or I've got, you know, something that just has no conservation value, it's going to be unlikely we're going to pursue that. Um, if it's a relatively natural habitat in good shape, I mean, like I said, typically the acreage thing for us is also kind of a, a, a delineator. And we look at ecoregion. So if you said I have 500 acres in the hill country, great. That's a good, it's a good size piece of land. If I have 500 acres in West Texas, you know, it, do, it doesn't make as much sense because the conservation impact is going to be so much less. Um, so we tend to tend to kind of down, have a sliding scale for ecoregions on what, what those parameters are going to look like. But there is no fixed, you know, exact thing for, for that. And so if you have a relatively small piece of land, let's say it's between 60 and 120 acres. Is there any kind of entity who would be interested in managing that sort of easement? Perhaps, it depends on where it is. If you say for right now, um, city of Austin is looking for watershed protection in Onion Creek and uh, Barton Creek watershed. They're paying landowners for those protected lands because that even that's a small acreage, it makes impact for that watershed protection. If you're in, you know, Kimball County and you come to me at 50 acres, there's not much I can do for you. Uh, so it just kind of depends on where you are in the specifics of that property. Typically around municipalities, you're going to have more options for funding and for, you know, perhaps conservation impact for smaller tracks. I'm sorry. Okay. And then another question is, um, Discussing some of the, I guess it's more of a statement, uh, to discuss some challenges of working with a property that has multiple owners. So like in the instance of you have some people who inherit the property um, with undivided interests or multi-generational issues, um, especially when not all want to do a conservation easement. Yeah, that happens. If, if you don't have everybody looking in the same direction, it's not going to happen. So, and, and it can't, if there, if there's an undivided interest and one person doesn't want to play, you can't do it. So um, that's, that's kind of a, an easy, it's either on or off situation. Uh, from the standpoint of multiple owners, it can also be problematic if you have one person who's like, you know what, we're going to, you know, put totally Bermuda hay out here and another person that we're, we're going to do this. And that, that's kind of a, a management style. And that's going to be something that, that, it's going to have to be kind of worked out internally, um, but the, the actual legal document is going to have to have everybody in agreement on it. Okay, and then I think um, one question that has been extremely relevant in, in the last year and a half within the Hill Country is repercussions of recent override of conservation easements. And so you spoke to this, but when it does come to infrastructure, um, what are there repercussions for an override of the conservation easement? And is there an opportunity to establish policy to help kind of mitigate that sort of situation? Um, Lori has been more of the capital in this. So, you know, the, the two examples, and we had one of our easements impacted by the uh, I can't think of it right now. Pipeline. Um, Your Morgan Permian Highway Pipeline. Yeah. Sorry, and I apologize. My internet has just been cutting in and out, so I've had to switch to my oh, phone gosh, to no get worries. back on here. So, um, but I didn't hear the question. So, go ahead and finish, we're, Mark. We're talking about co condemnation and impact easement. So okay. One of ours was impacted just along a, a boundary line. Um, I know another organization out in Hill Country had a, a major uh, impact on theirs. Um, like I said. It's not going to be a. It's not going to be a stopping uh, 
you know, mm -mm. Worse, uh, you will, you will get, they will get compensated just like the land, the landowner, the land trust will get some compensation from it as well. But, um, we have, tr we have tried, um, to increase that, that, that knowledge within certain groups. Um, I don't know, Lori, talk about what, you know, you and Jim and other folks have been working on in that, that regard. I mean, you know, we've been discussing this issue. I mean, there's, there's, you know, conservation easements, just land with conservation easements is such a small percentage of the lands in Texas. So it's not, it's just not an issue that is kind of, you know, raised to the top of that sort of radar screen for legislators to deal with. Um, but, you know, we've been talking about, you know, sort of, you know, with agency folks, but, you know, the reality is that conservation easements doesn't, you know, it won't prevent a condemnation. You know, we get, I get a lot of calls from landowners that are, you know, seeking that, you know, and hoping that a conservation easement might be a remedy for that. Um, and it's just, you know, it's not really there. At the federal level, you know, there has been, there was a bill filed um, last Congress actually, um, you know, to deal, you know, to try to avoid properties um, with conservation easements on them for pipelines, but um, that those would be FERC regulated pipelines and the vast majority of our Texas pipelines are just within the state's borders. And so they're only, um, you know, under the authority of the, the state and the railroad commission and the legislature. So, you know, we're sort of in our own little world down here in terms of that. Um, yeah, because I think, you know, in particular, when Mark was talking about the main reason for someone establishing a conservation easement is to have um, habitat preserved. Um, and really, you know, one of the things we've seen recently was there's endangered species habitat that is being affected by, um, you know, a natural gas pipeline coming through. And so, you know, obviously we're wrapping up a legislative session and it was kind of hot and heavy with some of the eminent domain reform discussion, but um, I'm just curious, you know, for myself as the, you know, executive director of TREAD, but also for the landowners who might be dealing with this issue moving forward again, because we have such vast infrastructure. We have many people moving here. You know, the, the need for infrastructure and energy is not going to slow down. If anything, it's going to speed up. So are there opportunities to have those conversations, like to Mark's point, to educate folks. Maybe it is, you know, at the regulatory level on why these conservation easements need to stay intact and working with, you know, the utility and other industries on opportunities to navigate around because to your point earlier, there's only a handful of acres that are currently in easements. So if there are mm -hmm routes or, you know, just ways of kind of coming to the table and negotiating on these things, I think, um, is of interest to all of us. So one, one fine point is that whenever the easement is enacted, the, the land trust becomes a, a, a party to that transaction. So uh, we have standing. And so whenever the Cres lines came across West Texas, whatever that was, eight, nine years ago, uh, we actually worked with the landowner that was going to be impacted before the PUC, and they ultimately went around that property. Was it us? I don't know. Um, we're dealing on another one out in, in uh, Calhoun County right now, and they're going to come across the property. So maybe it's a 50-50 that we have some, some say, but you do have a partner in the situation with the land trust because they now have standing with you to help argue that point. I mean, I think at this at this point, just because, you know, easements are such a small, you know, share of the lands that get impacted, um, you know, it's kind of a case by case basis, you know, when 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 an easement a property with an easement is presented with, you know, a condemnation, then they have to make that argument. I mean, I think if you look at the PEC or PUC's kind of criteria for some of the reasons why they avoid lands, uh, conservation easements meet a lot of those criteria. So it would make a lot of sense. Um, for them to be included, but um, they're also, you know, there's a lot of issues, a lot of political forces that, at, at, you know, in, at play in terms of, you know, whether or not that is something that, you know, should be elevated above anyone else's property. I mean, so there's, there's a lot, you know, a lot, a lot to consider there. Well, I guess I have a follow-up question um, because <clears throat> I serve on a committee at the federal level um, but have also been listening to a lot of what is happening around the country in terms of building out infrastructure. And to your point, kind of the 30, 
30, you know, some of what the current administration's plans are. So have you heard from uh, partner organizations in other states on how they are mitigating some of this same type of issue or is, or is it as much of an issue as it is here in Texas? So, I mean, there's, there's actually, a, there was a court, a case that was heard at the Supreme Court like last week that was out of New Jersey that was um, related to um, a pipeline project. Um, but in that case, it wasn't a conservation easement. It was more of a state's conserved lands. So, but there, you know, again, some states that do have, you know, these issues are, you know, as easements, you know, as more and more easements are on the ground, these 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 conflicts are happening more and more. And we, I think the land trust community sees, you know, these types of issues um, as sort of, you know, an issue for the future. Um, it's it's not been something that, you know, I think this is the, like I said, the bill that was introduced last session, um, last Congress was sort of the first time that this kind of bill had been introduced that was gonna like, you know, hey, you should avoid conservation easements. Um, you know, I mean, again, but you know, we've had our federal taxes in it for a long time. There's arguably a lot of, you know, federal investment in, in the, you know, in, in terms of tax deductions that have been granted um, and even federal dollars that have been invested in this project. So I think there's a strong argument to be made Made that they, they should have some protection. And especially as we move forward with 30 by 30 and, and conservation easements kind of get, you know, hopefully some more um, attention and some more um, funding and, you know, that that will also help to place them um, sort of at a higher level of, of you know, con you know, conservation in terms of from the perspective from all those other forces that are out there. Great. Well, I'm I think we were right on time. I don't see if we have any other questions, um, but uh, for those of you who do have additional questions after um, this tonight's discussion, please feel free to email me. I did provide uh, my information in the chat box, but also um, for those of you watching on Facebook, you can just go to treadcoalition.org and I'm happy to put you in touch with Mark and Lori and also provide additional resources should you have um, other questions or need additional information on conservation easements. Um, so with that, I don't see anything else coming in. Um, so I will let you guys go. Thank you very Thanks. much for, Thanks your for hosting us. your expertise. Yes, this was extremely informative and we're grateful um, for this discussion tonight. So um, everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.